think that's a positive evolution. Uh, not looking at the looking at the sinning Jew for for the uh, looking at his soul, and the soul transcends the mind and, and the heart. The soul knows things that the mind doesn't. Manis Friedman talks about uh, you know when you get drunk at Purim, mm -hmm. it's to tell you that your soul knows. Even mm -hmm. when your 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 mind is full of clutter, mm -hmm. it's full of arguments, mm -hmm. but the soul requires no arguments requires no debate. The soul really knows. So when you're drunk, the soul is your designated thinker. You know, and it's to put you in touch with, with your soul. And, and, and Hasidut really tries to do that. And when you still your mind, when you empty your mind, you get in touch with your soul, you just, you put on tefillin without thinking of why you're putting on tefillin. You go to, you pray without thinking of why you have to pray. There's something sort of uh, spiritually natural that comes out of it, and that's the Chabad way. So they won't look at your sin. They will see your sins as the, as the, uh, the consequence of your mind, of a cluttered mind. They don't hold your soul responsible for your sins. And that's the major advance of Hasidut. So that's why they, I think that's why, you know, we're not back to the biblical time. And that's why you won't see Chabad be insular like a lot of other Hasidic groups right, right. and say we cannot let our community be contaminated. Right. It's just an amazing thing yeah, yeah. that they go out into the so-called contaminated world yeah. fearless yeah. that their children are going to be exposed to these people who go and eat cheeseburgers and smoke on Shabbat and, and do these you know things that are you know desecration right. of the Torah and the laws that they live for. But somehow they have the ability to see that not as a source of contamination. And that's the exception rather than the rule. Because, you know, by and large, there, there is a fear of impurity. Yeah, it's still, there's a very different attitude towards sin in uh, Judaism and Christianity in which I grew up. And the religion in which I was raised, sin was a condition that human beings were sunk into and they could not rid themselves of it by their own efforts. They needed an otherworldly savior to come and take away the burden of sin. I've been going to synagogues for almost 20 years now, and I've never really heard a, a rabbi yet devote a whole sermon to sin. I've never heard a rabbi say, you're all a bunch of sinners. Right. It's not a Jewish way to talk. We don't get... It's too easy. We don't obsess over sin and go, oi, we're all sinners, I'm so sunk in sin. Right, right, right. It's, yeah, we study. We study and we, we act. Stu we study, we act, we dissect, we try to understand, we get into it. You know, it's, uh, I call it the difference between water and oil. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you drink water, it's easy, it's mindless. Yeah. So if uh, somebody's going to just absolve my sins, yeah. that's drinking water. Yeah. That doesn't challenge me. Yeah. Oil, you got to squeeze an olive. Yeah. you got to grow the olive, then squeeze it. And then you get something so much deeper, and then it mixes with your food, mixes with the salads, and it mixes with you. And it's a, it's a deeper process. So when you, so it's not a black and white world of you're a sinner and you're impure. You know, a yeah. sin does not define your soul. Yeah. A sin defines your action at that point in time. Yeah, so even the most exclusionary, exclusivist uh, sects of Judaism, they're still not telling their, their followers, oh, you're a bunch of sinners, you're all lost in sin, and oi, oi, oi. That's, that's not the Jewish attitude. It's not, it's not. Now, there's other uncomfortable stuff here on women. Yeah, yeah, go on ahead. On the relationship yeah. with women. Hit me. And um, the idea that the man has the power to absolve a woman of her vows. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you make of that, Luke? Well, I think... The Torah came out 3,200 years ago. That's when it was first published by. <laughs> that was first published by God, and uh, and that was a world where men did have the power. I mean, that right. that's the reality of uh, of the world of that time, and uh, people could not have survived in a in a world where physical strength was so important if if uh, if women had the same rights that they have today. Right. So. This is speaking about a time, and yet we're supposed to draw eternal lessons from it. And uh, I think one of the lessons is that the, the Torah and Judaism are very comfortable with difference. Mm -hmm. 
that uh, a woman should not wear a man's sword, for instance, and a man should not wear women's clothing, that a man must oven three times a day, and a woman is not required to, a man has all sorts of commandments that he is commanded to fulfill, that women are not obligated to. So men and women, Jew and Gentile, adults and children, all have very different roles in, in Judaism. So uh, it's, it's a religion of difference and of distinctions. He, uh, let's see. I imagine Richard Friedman's a little less comfortable. With well, he says, you know, the other side is that if a man causes his wife to violate a vow she made, then it is he who must live with the consequences. Mm -hmm. So he talks about, you know, on the one hand, you have the power to absolve her vow. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you are now responsible for the consequences of that action. So it's a double-edged sword. It's not as easy as the man being. And I'm sure it's still true sword. today that, I mean, I've never been married, but I've had relationships, and often what the other person does profoundly affects me. Um, I, I have to... I have to take the consequence if my girlfriend says something inappropriate at a Shabbat table. Like, I brought her there, and, and I, have to, I have to take the, the but, burden. So wives have to take the burden for what husbands do, and husbands have to take the burden of what wives do. Right. But uh, although this was written 3,200 years ago and a lot has changed, mm -hmm. uh, I think what a lot of modern Orthodox interpreters will tell you is that there's still a lot to be said for the differences. Yeah. and think that are relevant today. Mm -hmm. the, uh, one of them is the femininity and the, and the sexuality and the eroticism of the Orthodox woman. Mm -hmm. uh, it's demonstrated in the, the laws of family purity mm -hmm. deal very much with gaining power through sexuality. Yeah, I remember Heshi Freed on Froom Satire made the point that very ordinary looking women look totally hot when they're on the other side of the machitza. Right, you know... Because uh, they're out of their way, that makes them more more appealing. Yeah, like Manus Friedman once said, you know, I can't pray with women in synagogue because, you know, thank God. Right. He said, thank God, because I'm a man. But uh, one of the more, con one of, one of the more uh, controversial uh, rituals that, you know, they say the three most important things are Shabbat, Kashrut, and family purity yeah. in, in a marriage. Yeah, those but are fam fundamental rituals. But family Please. purity means that you can't touch your wife for half of your marriage. You literally cannot touch her, right? Yeah. Uh, and it's it's very complicated. I mean, the, the rules, once you learn them, take hours, and and eventually it's in, you know a third to a half of the month. Just, and secular people in particular just can't get their head around that. It's, it's one of the most difficult things to get around. Now, they have the classic explanation is that it's like a honeymoon every month. Yeah. But the, in the inner sanctum, you know, when, when Orthodox people, you know, speak to women who are considering becoming more religious, yeah. one of the things they will say is that this gives you power yeah. as a woman because he cannot touch you. So you have power. So your femininity, your sexuality, becomes a source of power. So as opposed to seeing it as being, you know, um, it's sort of a, almost an equalizer, if you will. Mm -hmm. Equalizer connected to the difference of being a woman. So there's no zeal to become like the man. Yeah. There's no imperative, there's no, there's no desire in the orthodox tradition of becoming like the man. Yeah. Which sort of confuses roles sometimes. And it's sort of disillusioning and it's confusing. Yeah, when women cease to be feminine, they, they cease to be attractive. And when men cease to be masculine, they cease to be attractive to women. So, mm. so one of the great things about Orthodox Judaism is you know who you are. You know who you are. So and many the, people out there don't know who they are. They don't know if they're male or female. They don't know what they stand for. They're just leaves blowing in the wind. Right, right. And that's one of the more sensitive areas. But, and, and family purity deals with that head-on. It's the more sort of extreme in embodiment of that notion of mm -hmm. the difference between, between genders. And it's probably one of the biggest hurdles because, you know, it's very hard not to touch your spouse for so long. And another thing that, that gives women tremendous power is, is monogamy. <laughs> like, if, if, you're not, if you're not religious, then you have much less 
sanction against going out having affairs and other forms of release but if your only release is can be with your spouse 